I want to thank you for attending the research project, Evaluating Vegetation Management Practices for Woody and Herbaceous Vegetation. There are CPDs available. If you're in one of our district locations, please be sure you've signed in the sign-in sheet. As soon as I get that with the training coordinator's signature, I will send out those CPD certificates to you. Internally on location, the same is true. We have a sign-in sheet back there, and I must verify that you've attended. Your sheets will be available to you today after this presentation if you signed in. We have resource group who did the research. We have Cheryl Daniels and Jenny Gulick who will be presenting today. It's an hour and a half presentation. We do ask that you save your questions to the end. For you, you on the webinar, please type your questions in and I will ask them at the end of the presentation. With that, I'll turn it over to Jenny and Cheryl. Well, thanks. And as uh, Jill said, we're here today to present the results of the um, evaluating vegetation management practices for woody and um, herbaceous vegetation. It was an ODOT research project. And the project was performed by the Navy Resource Group in collaboration with ODOT. We have a little bit of an agenda today. I'll tell you what we're going to talk about. Um, I don't think you, you, you know that, but it's just going to be an overview of the whole project. So we're going to start with an introduction to the research problem and why we did this. Then we're going to talk about research, research objectives and the tasks that were to be completed. We're going to have a technical discussion of the research uh, approach and the methods used to conduct the study. Then we're going to tell you and present to you the results of the study. We're going to have a discussion of the recommendations that were based on the results and then we're going to tell you how the recommendations are going to be implemented. And then as Jill said, we're going to have a question and answer period um, afterwards. So this particular research project, okay. Yeah, I'm ready. On the <laughs> webinar, we're just having a little technical difficulty. Okay, advancing slide. So, um, this research project was really unique because um, there were 25 tests conducted overall, and each test was replicated three times over a two-year period. So it was pretty in-depth. Um, and the reason for that is because roadside integrative management is uh, all the situations and issues are equally as complex. You have to be very precise, and you need to have time to study it. So in the time that we have this morning, um, we're going to be giving a detailed overview, I want to call it, of the project. But rest assured, the full details, um, information and results are available in the reports and all the appendices. So this project was definitely a team effort. Um, the guidance from the Office of Statewide Planning and Research was invaluable. And the leadership, insight, and cooperation of ODOT Central Office and the Technical Advisory Committee, the names that you see here, um, were key to the success of this project. And since they might participate in the um, question and answer period later, I'd like to uh, quickly introduce the ODOT and DRG team members that are here. From ODOT, we've got Scott Lucas and Jill Martindale. And from Davey Resource Group, I'm Jenny Gulick. Principal Investigator, Ruth Lansomnowski is right here. She's the co-principal investigator. Cheryl Daniels um, was the project manager. We have Brad McBride, who's the site manager, and Scott Larson, our biologist. So just wanted to let you know who who's who. And I'll read. Just let. Just let, okay. <laughs> so some of you may ask, how did uh, how did you come to do this project? Why did you do it? Well, ODOT, um, as you know, has the responsibility to maintain over 43,000 miles of roads and to keep those roads safe, functional, and attractive. So in such a large, multifaceted, 24-7 operation, it needs to be executed efficiently and effectively and to industry standards. So wanting to be the best that they could be, ODOT initiated this roadside integrated 
vegetation management project. Next slide. The goal of the project was to increase efficiency and effectiveness and to decrease costs of ODOT's, I'm going to say IVM, Integrative Vegetation Management, IVM, program. And more specifically, the objectives were to achieve these six goals. The first goal was to decrease the amount of noxious weeds and plants. And really what that means is to be a good neighbor. We've got a lot of private property and adjacent property to ODOT right-of-way, so we don't want to get rid of the noxious weeds. Be a good neighbor. And be environmentally, be environmental stewards. Those, are, those weeds are noxious for a reason, and that's why they're on the state list. So that was one. The second one was better safety for the workers and the traveling public. Actually, that's probably the number one goal. Obviously, we want to keep the road safe. Vegetation plays a part in keeping the road safe, and the maintenance of that vegetation can impact safety. So that was one of the goals. We wanted to extend the maintenance cycle for equity vegetation. The reason we wanted to do that was because if you have longer cycles, you are out there less time. And if you are out there with uh, personnel and equipment, you are decreasing costs. So that was the reason for that objective. We also wanted to make use of new and more effective chemical uh, methods for vegetation management and mechanical methods. And the reason for that was the old adage, work smarter, not harder. So we've got all these tools at our disposal. What are the right tools for that job? And the last one was to improve the abilities of workers to use these tools. And what that means is it, it's having training for the uh, employees. Next. There it is, next one. Gotcha. Thank you. Please, and you can come come up too if you want to make Hello? sure that I yeah. the channel. Please, Please move your phone. Send an email to someone or whatever. Okay, maybe she'll come up. <laughs> or so, but it's not. I have yeah. witnessed. Yeah. We can ah, hear your conversation. You. Please mute your phone. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Next slide. So while this was a practical project, you know, based on reality, we were out there in the field. It really began with a seven-month true research phase where these tasks were completed. We did surveys and with discussions with ODOT um, districts and county garages regarding their current roadside integrated vegetation management equipment, resources, and SOPs. We also looked into the research um, that other DOTs were doing across the country as well as looking in to see what academia was doing and um, what vendor research was showing. We wanted to see what other people were doing, didn't want to reinvent the wheel, and perhaps there was something out there that would apply to ODOT and be you know, a, a perfect solution in some situations. And the third thing we, we researched was integrating ASHTO um, current re recommendations into the um, literature. Then, based on those research and options and recommendations, these were all given to ODOT for evaluation and approval for the in-field testing part in phase two. So all ODOT's technical advisory committee considered all the recommendations that were presented to them for improving roadside integrated, integrated vegetation management, and they ultimately chose the ones that should be tested out in the field. And so then that, began, that became phase two. So the next slide. Phase two then had these three primary tasks. One, to conduct field days and create technical briefs for each test. This was a kind of a technology transfer task, and it was to orient and include ODOT staff in the whole process from the start. The second task was to create this guide for roadside integrated vegetation management um, of the prohibited noxious weeds. And this was going to be a customized guide with comprehensive reference information on problem vegetation and with options for control. And the third task, the biggie, was, of course, to perform the field testing um, out, in, out on the ODOT right-of-ways using the mechanical and chemical other control methods in real-life situations. And this was done across the state. So we're going to get a little more into detail about these three tasks now. Next slide. So the first task was of the field days and the technical brace. So even if we found a silver bullet for the most difficult vegetation management issue, 
it wouldn't hit its mark unless ODOT um, knew how to load the gun, find the target, and take aim. So what we needed was everybody to understand the process, the expected outcomes, and how the results of this project would benefit them. So field days were conducted regionally in the state, and um, they were kind of set up half classroom and then half out in the field to go see that test um, being performed in real life. We had um, a single regional location, and then we brought in other districts around there. So again, trying to get everybody involved in the project so they could see what's, what's going on. The technical briefs that I mentioned, there's an example up on the screen. It was simply a one-page summary of that test with a map, how it was replicated, what the, and what was going to be tested in that particular site. The next slide. The second task was to create this roadside integrated vegetation management guide. So while it was compact, and clearly it needed to be very simple, not an encyclopedia people have to carry around. Um, it really has an amazing amount of information in it. It has noxious weed descriptions, seasonal photos of every single plant, um, information on where it's found in Ohio, even if there's similar looking species out there so people might get confused. It's got a list of what you might confuse it with so that you know exactly what you're, what you're doing, what you've got out there. It has control methods, and it has what we're calling an integrated vegetation management level of concern. So what that is is a ranking, and that takes into consideration all in one lump, like the growth rate of that plant, is it really fast, the reproduction rate, does that 10,000 seeds, um, the difficulty of control. Put all those together, and then we rank them, and so this guy will show you that plant and give you its IBM level of concern. It also has applicator guidance, so information on, okay, you know this plant, it says how to control it, how do I do that? So it has guidance in there for the people actually doing the work out in the field. It has um, information like the ideal control application, um, timing per plant, so you don't just go out there and miss the plant, it has the best time, so that makes the best use of time and money and the uh, supplies tells you how to calibrate your equipment. It has worksheets for the crews and worksheets for properly mixing herbicides, conversion tables for quantities and lane miles. Um, it even has ODOT forms that are required by the crews to, to complete. It's available in print, an electronic format, and soon to be, a, um, I understand, a smartphone app. So this is going to be readily available for everybody out there. Next slide. The largest task of um, phase two was the field testing. And what this map shows you is the uh, locations of the 25 IVM tests that were performed. And the locations, as you can see, were geographically and also important, as important ecologically representative of the state as a whole. So Cheryl Daniels, the project manager, is uh, now going to present the results of this project of the field test and talk about the supplies, the equipment, and the staffing used in each test. So as Jenny mentioned, uh, there were 25 field tests conducted across the state. You can switch to the next slide, please. Um, these tests were conducted using ODOT staff and equipment and materials for all the tests. Um, so we, what we did as Davy Resource Group is just let them know what applications to make, chose the herbicides, chose the time we went out there, helped them do their mixes, that sort of thing. And then we performed assessments of each test, monitoring the vegetation results. We monitored the time it took to apply herbicides, the time it took to mow, trim, remove trees. And um, each test had three replications, and the replications were set up in a randomized complete block design that allowed for one method to be uh, tested in each replication. We performed statistical data analysis of the vegetation results. We performed a cost analysis for the ROI, that's the return on investment. 
and we looked at aesthetics and safety in making our uh, judgments. <clears throat> Testing was grouped by management zone based on ODOT's Ohio Maintenance Operations Manual. We aim to build upon ODOT's zone management approach. And if you take a look at the uh, diagram here, you can see where each of the zones are. Zone 1 being right at the road edge. Zone uh, 2, a little bit further in. This is the operational or recovery zone. Zone 3, the transition zone, where you would want um, more native, low-growing species. And then zone 4 is on the back side of the right of way, where you might have some trees. So we looked at what ODOT's goals were for each of the zones and sought to um, help ODOT achieve those goals. So in zone one, where you're looking to get vegetation-free area, we sought to eliminate or reduce mechanical maintenance. Zone two, which is heavily mowed, usually four times a year, um, we sought to reduce the amount of mowing. Zone three, we sought to control the noxious and invasive weeds and remove small brush and trees and prevent them from regrowing. Zone four involves um, pruning and removal of trees and preventing their regrowth where they were not wanted any longer. So I'm going to be presenting you a summarized overview of the tests, the results, and the recommendations. So a lot of these tests are going to be grouped together. But um, for details on each of the tests, as Jenny mentioned, um, you can refer to our report, which will be posted here at this link probably within a week's time, I would imagine. Zone 1 is the vegetation-free zone. We're going to start here. It's the closest to the roadway. It could be in the median, or it could be just on the uh, right-hand shoulder of the road. But the goal of Zone 1 is usually going to be bare ground. That's what is dictated in the Ohio Maintenance Operations Manual. I know that's not always practical, because sometimes you have construction obstructions that prevent maintenance in there. Um, and sometimes you may not want to have bare ground if you have erosion concerns. So we had two tests um, set up for Zone 1. One was to achieve bare ground, and that used chemical methods as well as equipment. And the other test was using uh, mechanical maintenance. We set up a guardrail mower and compared that to the standard operating procedure of a string trimmer. So let's look at the vegetation results in Zone 1. Um, here, we used a combination of herbicides. We used two different combinations and achieved great results. And we did uh, Rodeo Esplanade 200 SB and Oust compared to Rodeo Esplanade and Perspective. One application each spring. And uh, in two years of testing, the vegetation coverage was reduced to 0%. So that was really great. Um, we compared that to the SOP in the area tested, which was Rodeo. The application, the initial application happened at the same time, early spring. Uh, but rodeo only was effective for approximately 60 days before we needed to reapply. So uh, three applications were needed during the growing season to maintain adequate vegetation control. So if we look at the return on investment, three applications of rodeo were actually cheaper than one application of uh, the herbicide combinations. That's due to the cost of the herbicide. So one application of the combination herbicides was about $67, whereas three applications of Rodeo were $3.70. So if you're looking at saving a little bit of a cost, the Rodeo is the way to go. But um, you know there could be problems where maybe your crews get busy on dry days, and, and they're not able to get out there to do your second or your third application of Rodeo and then your vegetation grows to an unacceptable level. So you, you want to take that into consideration in deciding which herbicide you want to choose. Rodeo may not be the recommended one for that reason. We would actually, if you compare the cost, go for the combination herbicides, you'll get a longer life out of it. Now the third photo at the bottom here shows uh, a guardrail mower test site. So this is where maintained vegetation was allowed underneath the rail. And uh, with the guard rail mower, there's no herbicide involved. It was just the mowing. So depending on how fast the vegetation was growing, it would need to happen three or four times per year. And again, it's not controlled. It's just maintained for site distance reasons. So equipment used in zone one was a skid sprayer with spoonless nozzles and a control panel. And that went into the back of a truck. 
Um, this is a 425-gallon skid sprayer. Uh, we found that the spray truck, we, sh we would recommend getting one spray truck per county of at least equal abilities to what was tested for the project. Uh, spraying is uh, less expensive and it is safer to use than mechanical maintenance. It keeps people off the roadside so there's less exposure. And we really liked the Raven control panel inside the unit. It uh, monitored the speed of the truck and the output of herbicide to avoid under and over application <coughs> of herbicide. And the return on investment for just applying in zone one would be achieved in one hour of applications or 13 miles of applications. And that's using a six foot boomless nozzle. So that will get you from the edge of the road over the guardrail or over the cable rail either way. So that's um, going to help you reduce your labor hours in mechanical maintenance. Other equipment we used was for the mechanical test, we used a guardrail mower. And this uh, unit fit around the rails, whether it was cable rail or guardrail. It did a good job of uh, maintaining that area. And it was much more effective, uh, much more cost effective compared to string trimming. And it's safer because the worker exposure to traffic is reduced. And that uh, your SOP for that is using string trimmers. Um, different areas use different amount of string trimmers, so we, we looked at different ways, but the guardrail mower was always much faster. It travels about one mile per hour to do the maintenance. The um, spray truck, by the way, was doing about nine miles an hour. So just for a comparison for you guys, just to see the uh, rate of how fast the operation can happen. We needed to buy a tractor to mount the guardrail mower onto, and if you needed to do that, if you needed to buy the tractor and the mower, you could return your investment in 256 miles of rail maintenance. Now, that might be too expensive for one county to afford, but if you share it with a district, particularly in areas where you have a lot of maintained rails, whether it's cable or guardrail, like I-71, that could pay off pretty quickly. Now, moving to zone two. As I mentioned earlier, this area gets a lot of maintenance uh, from mowing, usually four times a year. And the mowing that's happening is usually because the broadleaf weeds are growing fast, they're growing taller than your grass. So a lot of times people are going out there to mow the weeds. They're not really going out there to mow the grass. So our test, uh, we did the uh, chemical test and mechanical test, and we were focusing on trying to reduce the amount of mowing that needed to happen. So the chemical test used plant growth regulator, or PGR. We also used broadleaf herbicides. And we found that applying herbicides is much cheaper than the labor cost of mowing. Equipment tested in zone two was, again, using that same spray truck we used in zone one, but we used a different nozzle. And uh, we also were looking at slopes that are going to be on the interchanges and uh, maybe in the medians, different areas. So there were slope mowers tested, as well as a bat wing wet blade. So let's talk about the plant growth regulator results first. The plant growth regulators, the PGR, we use that to reduce seed heads. And that helped us reduce one to two mow cycles per year, depending on um, how we applied it when, it when it went down in different areas. There were several tests with it. We would recommend applying a plant growth regulator every other year in the early spring. And it was enabled us to eliminate the Memorial Day mow. We found that the plant growth regulator worked for approximately 60 days. And the recommended plant growth regulator we would use is Plateau. We put that up against Embark 2S uh, IVM, but uh, Plateau is much cheaper at 343 per acre. As I mentioned, you're often mowing broadleaf weeds out there. And you know, what do you care if there's weeds? on the right of way, well, the only concern really is the height of them um, for you guys. And, and that's what's causing you to mow frequently. So if you look at the photos, you can see on the bottom photo, it's just covered in flowers from a particular weed here. And these are just really good photos because they really de delineate the plots very well. In the top photo, you can see a 
clear marker of where the plots were. So that whole area that's just grass in there was where we applied the broadleaf herbicide. And this is a plot that did not have herbicide on it, and that's the back edge. In these plots, we used a 22-foot nozzle um, to achieve that broadleaf control. So all the, all the herbicides we tested, they all worked really well. Um, just talk about some of the differences briefly. We found the perspective uh, is good for reducing seed head, so maybe you want to use that at a time if you're not using PGR. A problem we found, if, if it is a problem for you, is that it causes a slight browning of the grass uh, for a few weeks during the dry part of the season. Triclopyr 3 did not cause any browning, neither did the milestone. Uh, with the Triclopyr 3, we did see some instances where the grass grew a little bit taller in those plots. The cost of application just for the labor uh, of using the truck, it's, it's 55 cents an hour, or sorry, 55 cents per acre. Um, and the cost for herbicides ranges depending on which one you're using from 460 per acre to 735 an acre. <coughs> this allowed us to reduce also one to two mows per year. We looked at slopes in zone two, um, the hard to reach areas. This top area, the two slides show an area and a median with a slope and barrier walls on both sides. And it was difficult, if not impossible, to get mechanical equipment in there to maintain the area. But there would be calls by the public about you know, how awful it looked. Maybe there were things coming over the wall causing sight distance issues. So they would need to get in there to try to do something. Uh, so this was an area that we addressed. We did not do any mechanical maintenance in there. We just did the uh, broadly herbicides. We didn't care about the grass. Uh, the height of the grass was not an issue. When the grass got tall enough, it just flopped over and uh, was not an issue. It was the broadleaf weeds that were standing up, getting up to the height of the five-foot wall and even above that became the issue. So. The herbicides worked very well, but we would recommend actually using the milestone because it is um, very gentle on the grass. It didn't prevent seed head suppression. And that could be important on uh, slopes, which tend to be gravelly and devoid of nutrients. So if you want to get your grass um, growing well and helping to prevent erosion out there. In the bottom photo here, you can see some mechanical equipment that we tested. There was a cut quick slope mower, which is a ride-on chariot style mower. It had uh, rotary heads and a uh, wider depth than the Alamo Trax, which was a remote controlled unit operated <coughs> down below where the operator could stand uphill from the unit and uh, watch where it was mowing. Uh, we found that neither unit were as fast as just spraying the slope. That's what we would recommend that they do in this area instead. And most areas should be maintained with the boomless nozzles off the skid sprayer, as is seeing happening here. Um, if, and they could do that from the top of this guardrail. There was also an area where they could have <coughs> driven on the flat area and sprayed up using the nozzles or getting the hose out of the skid sprayer and spraying the rest of it. And they wouldn't have to worry about any erosion that the slope mowers could cause. But, um, the cut quick is, goes a little bit faster because it's got a wider deck size. The Alamo track, um, the remote control, can go on steeper slopes. And it can handle denser, weedier vegetation. Okay, so the equipment used in Zone 2 was, again, that spray truck that we used in Zone 1. And it rides about 9 miles an hour. And the spray truck is a multi-use piece of equipment. So your return on investment will be achieved faster when the piece of equipment is used for more than one activity or more than one zone. So when we figured return on investment in our slides here and in our report, we were looking at it for one activity per zone. But if you used it in zone one, and zone two, and zone three, you're reducing, uh, you know, you're achieving your return on investment a lot faster. So with a 10-foot nozzle, 
we were able to achieve a return on investment in 39 acres or four, mile, four hours of application compared to string trimming. So we always um, look to compare it to something. So what is the standard SOP? In this case, um, it might have been string trimming. We used a 22-foot nozzle, and the return on investment could be achieved in 135 acres or five hours compared to using that Alamo track, which was a remote controlled mower. And uh, the Alamo tracks would not be paid off in labor savings due to being the slowest and most expensive method compared to the cut quick or the spray truck. Okay, so also in zone two, we tested a batwing wet blade system. That is a mower that has a small tank mounted on top and there's hoses that run down to the blades with grooves carved in them by the manufacturer and it allows for simultaneous mowing with an herbicide that's uh, with a water-based herbicide application. So you're doing basically a cut stubble application. In testing we use the wet blade to reclaim an area that had been overgrown with a very high percentage of broadleaf. Now this would be an area with you had used a forestry mulcher, you, you'd used it to reclaim an area. You don't want it to allow it to regrow back to where it was one year ago. You use the wet blade, that way mower to keep the brush and trees from regrowing, keep the vegetation more manageable with turf. As vegetation develops into brush and trees, it gets harder to manage, more expensive. So if you keep it as turf, it'll be um, quicker, easier, cheaper. The uh, bat wing wet blade can be used on the back slope of right of ways where the spray truck boomless nozzles can't reach for the annual mowback. You can apply broadleaf herbicides later in the year as long as the plants are still growing with its cut stubble treatment. So we wouldn't recommend buying a bat wing wet blade and replacing all your other bat wings. If you're going to be mowing the near the roadway, you're boomless nozzles can reach adequately there. You might as well just use your regular bat wings. They're, they're very efficient at that. But, you know, areas where you can't reach with the boomless nozzles that'll take longer to do directed applications, the wet blade is a good option for you. And uh, for the cut quick and the Alamo tracks, well, like I said, the cut quick can go faster than the Alamo track because it has a bigger deck size. Uh, maybe you'd want to maintain some turf areas. Uh, but we really found that the in areas where the Alamo track shined above the cut quick, you could have just as easily been spraying with boomless nozzles or, or directed applications. Let's move on to zone three, the transition zone, where it should be comprised of low maintenance native plants. What we found growing was a lot of noxious and invasive plants, small shrubs, and small trees, and uh, we sought to target those. So we had chemical tests and mechanical tests set up in zone three as well. Our chemical tests used various herbicides depending on the targeted plant, and our chemical tests were set up to be compared with the SOP mechanical maintenance method, the herbicide effectively controlled problem areas and did so much more efficiently than the mechanical method. And in some cases, the mechanical methods did not, did well, they never controlled the weeds, but in some cases, they actually made them the populations denser, we found, through the period of testing. So new equi mechanical equipment that was purchased and used for testing was a skid sprayer with a spray gun, a rotary wet blade mower, and backpack sprayer. Let's look at the results on the noxious and invasive plant testing. Um, all tests with noxious and invasive plants use directed applications with a spray gun. So we didn't use the boomless nozzles here. We just took out the hose and, and directed the applications with the spray gun. And we found noxious weeds build up a seed bank 
and they have roots that get well established, so it could take more than one year to get effective control. So we don't want people to try something for one year and then walk away, because you might reduce your population, but if you don't keep going for a couple of years, you won't uh, see long-lasting control. It'll come back. So you want to completely knock it out, basically, before you walk away and just um, stop applying in an area. We got good results from our herbicides targeting noxious weeds. Um, there are times, though, where you are going to find you're going to need to rotate your herbicides to use herbicides with different modes of action if your plant starts to show herbicide resistance. And so one case of this could be Johnson Graph. We tested Rodeo and Outrider on Johnson Graph, and we actually had good results with both herbicides. But Rodeo, we've heard, is starting to become, or Johnson grass rather, is starting to become resistant to the use of rhodia. We didn't see that in our testing, but it could happen. So just be mindful of that with any applications you're doing. We did our applications in midsummer when the Johnson grass was 18 inches to 24 inches in height. And we would end up recommending the outrider. We didn't have to use a very high rate of it. And uh, it is grass selective. so. It just killed the Johnson grass. It did nothing to the other grasses that were growing on the site. With the rodeo, it's a non-selective herbicide, so you have to be you know, particularly careful about where you're spraying that. You want to make sure you're hitting just your target uh, noxious weed. For Japanese knotweed, this is a weed that can grow well over 10 feet tall and tends to take over an area. We found great results with the Ecomazapir 2SL that was used. <laughs> We did our application with, um, or with a spray gun, and we did that midsummer. With uh, Japanese knotweed, you have to be really careful with mowing if you go that route. When you cut plant parts and they get stuck on the mower, you could easily transport them to another site where there is no knotweed. The plant parts might fall off and uh, take root and repropagate and start a new colony in another location. So you definitely don't want to um, be spreading the knotweed around. Poison hemlock, which is down here in the middle, uh, was effectively controlled with prospective or milestone applied in early spring. Early spring is the ideal time for applying the herbicide, but it could be applied in the spring or the fall to the rosette. Poison hemlock can be irritating to lungs, so be careful with any mechanical maintenance that's done with on that uh, poison hemlock. <clears throat> Kudzu is uh, coming up from the south, and it is a vine that tends to take over areas, covering them up, covering up trees and such. And uh, we found effective control with both streamline and milestone applied in late summer. For um, Johnson grass and knotweed, we were able to spray for three years and each year we had to apply because although the um, rates of the noxious weed kept going down each year, they were still coming back. So as I talked about, you don't want to give up after one year. Poison hemlock we were able to apply for two years and for our testing process. But because we, we thought we'd have to apply for more than one year, but we actually got such good results with one year of treatment that we did not need to treat again. If we move on to talk about the small trees and brush that we um, worked with, we found that foliar, mow, then ground applications, and cut stubble applications were all viable options for control. With autumn olive, we did um, foliar applications prior to mowing it down, and we found that streamline and milestone when mixed with triclopyr 4, which is an ester, to penetrate the leaves and the stem, showed really good results, but it needed a follow-up backpack sprayer application the following year to achieve complete automotive control. We used a flail mower, and we tested um, herbicides before mowing and after mowing to see which would be more effective, and we found very good results with Fordon K applied after mowing. So we definitely recommend that. Um, Tordon K is a restricted herbicide, so if there is an aversion to using restricted herbicide, 
I guess the next uh, best option would be streamline. We did not see significant results there, but there were some very good results. There was a trend, a positive trend, and it just really needed more time to evaluate. That was one of our test sites we had to um, reset. So uh, there was some inadvertent contractor application on our original site. So we didn't have as long a time window to monitor that one. Now, uh, like in earlier, we talked about a bat wing wet blade. We had a rotary wet blade that we tested over guardrails. And it's set up very similar. We've got a concentrated herbicide tank mounted on the unit. And the hoses run to the ends of the blades. And there's a, a channel cut out of the blade. And as the blades cut the vegetation and wipe over it again, it's a cut stubble treatment. So it basically eliminates the need to make two trips out there. You don't have to do a spraying and um, a mowing. The, this is one of our test sites that also got sprayed inadvertently by a contractor. So we needed to reset the test site. And we didn't have a very long window to evaluate the results. So they're a little bit inconclusive, but we'll share what we have found. Um, we had a shorter window for assessments, but there were good results observed for 60 days. However, our conclusion was it may not be worth buying this extra piece of equipment, a more expensive mower head, to achieve this objective of controlling woodies behind a guardrail. If you had a skid sprayer with the boomless nozzles, you could just spray over the guardrail, um, control the woodies and the broadleaf weeds, and then you just have some grass back there. And maybe you only need to mow the grass once per year with the uh, guardrail mower if you were using broadleaf herbicides and even a PGR mixed in there. Um, with the rotary wet blade and even that uh, bat wing wet blade, these are specialized pieces of equipment where you're mowing and you're using herbicides. There's a calibration process. We definitely would recommend using uh, trained operators who are consistently <coughs> using a piece of equipment so they gain familiarity with it so they don't, um, you know, overapply, underapply, inadvertently break a piece of machinery. It's just really helpful for optimizing performance. Okay, some other uh, tests we did in Zone uh, 3 were the uh, forestry mulcher tests. And uh, here what we found most effective was to do mechanical mowing followed by a ground application of Tordon K. We did some foliar applications as well before mowing. Um, those were not as successful as the ground application. With the Tordon K after mowing, we found that the grass came in and took over, and we had very low percentage of broadleaf weeds and shrubs coming back in. The mow-only plots, in comparison, after a year, it didn't look like we mowed at all. Um, it was completely grown back with shrubs and small trees. So definitely, if you're going to get out that equipment and spend the time to mow an area, you should do something to prevent it from regrowing to where it was a year ago. Um, Another test we did was a foliar application to small trees and shrubs. We did, used a directed application using a spray gun. We did this on a slope in an area to replicate um, small trees that you might have growing under bridges. And the results were not as effective as we would have liked. They weren't as effective as the basal bark treatment we did. Just down the way a little bit, we did basal bark testing of uh, some small trees. And we made those applications in early winter. And um, yeah, we had really good results. We also tested the basal bark application on Tria Heaven, which is an invasive tree that uh, grows pretty rampantly. And you can see from the photo here, is not easy to control just by mechanical means alone. So in this photo, the prior growing season, like four months before this photo was taken, there were about 100 Tria Heaven trees per plot. And they were cut down by chainsaw. And after four months, we had six trees of heaven coming back in. I think we were up to 500, even 900 tree of heaven trees per plot after mechanical removal. So don't do it. <laughs> uh, basil bark was very, very effective at keeping tree of heaven controlled. We used Tricopure 4 mixed in basil oil 
and that would be the recommended herbicide to use. It um, was simple to mix, uh, not very costly. <coughs> Equipment that we used in Zone 3 was a spray truck, as I mentioned, doing direct-stick application. So this is a different spray truck than we used in Zone 1 and 2 with the boomless nozzles and the control panel. This one we just focused on using that hose and spray gun, but that bigger truck had the spray gun and the hose as well. So if you had just the bigger unit, you could use that as well. And remember earlier I talked about return on investment, how you can get it faster if you use it for multiple areas. Well, <coughs> that's, that would be a way that you could return your investment on that larger unit, uh, which is about twice the price of this one. This one's about $4,000. The larger one's about $8,000. We also use the backpack for our basal bark applications. So you can see Brad um, here doing some basal bark applications to kill the tree of heaven on this slope. And it was really effective for controlling trees under six inches in diameter. The cost is so much less than if you allow a tree to grow to full size and then you're trying to control it with chainsaws and forestry buckets or getting up hillsides or guy trims, different, different means that are expensive. Okay, uh, the, last, the last two pieces of equipment kind of be thought of as a proactive piece of equipment to use to maintain your vegetation. These are more reactive pieces of equipment. So after your vegetation has grown, what can you do to get it back under control? So uh, when controlling noxious weeds, brush, and small trees, herbicides are more effective, less labor intensive, and less costly than mechanical maintenance. Um, you can see the cost per acre here of the forestry mulcher and uh, cost per acre here for the wet blade system. If I go back a slide, you can see for the spray truck, the cost per acre is so much less. Uh, depending on what you're spraying, you know, how thick it is, how tall it is, it's going to determine how long it takes you to spray, how dense it is, and then the uh, cost for the backpack, the time there. So the labor cost per acre goes way up when vegetation gets large enough to require maintenance by these types of equipment. For the forestry mulcher, the labor cost per acre, $132, versus if we had a manual crew, <coughs> we did the tree of heaven, $3,900 per acre. For uh, zone three, we're looking at three-year returns on investment, partly because our study was three years. We were able to do three years of testing and assessment. And as I talked about, the seed banks tend to stick around um, if you want to do more than one year's worth of applications. So looking at a three-year return of investment on this rotary wet blade mower compared to the standard operating procedure of just using a regular motory head over there, it would be 99 acres or 1,028 hours to achieve that return on investment. So. Um, we feel that managing the vegetation uh, so you don't need an R-mounted rotary mower is important. If you just had grass behind the guardrail here, that uh, you could accomplish this by using a spray truck with the PGR and the broadleaf herbicide, as I mentioned earlier, and then using that guardrail mower perhaps one time a year. Moving on to zone four. Zone four are the trees on the edge of the right-of-way. This is an area where you would ideally not have trees tall enough at mature height to fall and become a hazard to the traveling public. Tree maintenance and tree removal is expensive in terms of crew hours and equipment used to perform the work. We performed six tests focused on tree maintenance and removal in zone four. We had herbicide tests for tree maintenance and to prevent regrowth of trees after removal. And we had mechanical tests of tree maintenance and removal for trees that could be reached from the edge of the road and from trees that had to be uh, reached from off the roadside. Our recommendations are focused on efficiency, safety, and proper arboricultural techniques. So the herbicide test that we did for tree maintenance is called chemical side trimming. 
We found crenide F at a cost of $100 per acre to be very effective at controlling lateral limbs on the six different species that we tested it on. You could use chemical side trimming for spot treatments, targeting limbs near fines for site distance. For example, State Route 7 is a two-lane road. It has limbs encroaching signs, causing obstructions to the signs. In some areas, it's hard to shut down a lane. You could use chemical side trimming to extend the maintenance cycle to mechanical prior to mechanical pruning by defoliating limbs. That may give you a year or two before you need to get a mechanical maintenance crew out there, essentially some guys up in a box. Or you could extend the mechanical cycle after pruning, once trees have started to sprout prolifically. Maybe you'll hit the lateral limbs with the herbicide and, and gain yourself some more years before you'd have to get that mechanical crew back out there. For mechanical maintenance, we used a forestry bucket truck and an all-terrain tree trimmer, like a sky trimmer or giraffe. And we found that the forestry bucket truck achieves natural target pruning, which is healthier for trees, as the trees conceal the wound and create callus and wound wood. The sky trim left stumps, which don't seal with callus and wound wood. They create areas for decay to spread and disease to infect the open wound. The forestry bucket truck did not take significantly longer. That operation, that method, did not take significantly longer than the all-terrain tree trimmer method. Part of that reason is the chipping process was included in the time that we collected. The ground cleanup crew time uh, was a limiting factor to increasing efficiency for the method. The pr at the beginning of um, phase one, what we were hearing from the ODOT managers was a problem with the sky trim. Was that it's been the chipping operation that has slowed the process down for the sky trim, preventing it from getting a full day's worth of work in. It only gets a couple hours in before they need to wait for the ground crew to clean up. So we focused um, three, three tree maintenance and removal tests on chipping capabilities of the standard operating procedure Vermeer BC 1500 brush chipper to a Bandit 1850 whole tree chipper with a cab for the operator and a grapple to help load the chipper. We found with an experienced, skilled crew, the Vermeer chipper is an effective and efficient chipper. The chipping process was made more efficient with the use of the excavator loader to not only sort logs, but load them into the chipper as well. The Vermeer offers a tree commander remote control that we did not test, uh, but we feel that it could be tested and purchased for the excavator operator to run the chipper, which would further minimize the number of ground crew personnel needed, and in particular, that would be directly involved with operating the chipper, which is where the safety hazard often comes in with using a chipper. The banded chipper is self-propelled, but the track movements are slow. There's a grapple on it, as I mentioned, which is helpful for some feeding of the chipper and keeps weaker workers away from the chipper table. But the grapple is a little clumsy, a little slow as well, so, um, and, and it has a limited reach. The bandit is most successful when logs are sorted, dragged, and loaded into the chipper by an excavator as well. So just some small handling by that grapple arm worked okay. Um, the return on investment purchase price for the banded whole tree chipper with the optional cab and grapple loader is, is very high. It's a $284,000 piece of equipment, so it takes a very long time to return your <coughs> investment. Although that whole tree chipper is capable of chipping large uh, diameter branches, trunks, uh, normal operations, ODOT operations don't need that large size of wood put through the chipper as it would be left on site or hauled away. So in three tests that we compared the Bandit to the Vermeer BC 1500, the Bandit never showed consistent results that it was significantly faster than the Vermeer. So we found little reason to recommend the unit when compared to the Vermeer being loaded with the assistance of the excavator. And better yet, if there had the tree commander, it would have reduced the labor around the chipper as well. 
However, uh, the roadway services team has been using the Bandit for many roadside clearing projects since its arrival and has found it's improved their efficiency. So we just were not able to find those consistent results through our testing. If you need to remove trees, uh, we would recommend the brown brontosaurus. That was found to be the most efficient uh, means to remove trees compared to the other methods that we've tested. When the conditions will allow it, it should be used. It can be used on or off-road as long as the excavator can drive to the trees. The brontosaurus requires only one operator to fully take down and ship a tree. It's an all-in-one device. It can use a spotter to help um, look for safety hazards or if there's a tree that's a little bit too large for the head um, to mulch all the way to the ground, they devise a process that works really well for taking down trees that's too large for that mulcher head. Limitations to the brown brontosaurus are really where the excavator can grow. So, it, go. so if you have a very steep hillside that's muddy or icy, that's going to be a limiting factor. So the brontosaurus removal method is safer and uses less labor and equipment than any of the other removal methods tested. But no matter what tree removal method used, the crew experience and size were really critical to efficiency. Cleanup crews, um, efficiency, and familiarity with the work were important to the efficiency. Any specialized piece of equipment should always be run with a trained and consistent operator. So that goes for the brontosaurus, the all-terrain tree trimmer, the bandit operator, the bucket operator. Um, forestry equipment uh, really needs that experienced crew out there using the equipment on a regular basis. So as far as the equipment, um, as I mentioned earlier, the forestry bucket truck with the operator being able to perform proper natural target pruning is a recommended piece of equipment uh, for trimming. It can be used for removal, but it just wasn't as efficient in a timely manner compared to the other methods. Spray truck was really good for controlling the uh, lateral limbs for the chemical side trim. Used just for this application alone, the return on investment would be achieved, achieved after four hours, sorry, excuse me, after two hours, or 1.16 miles of application. For tree removal equipment, the brontosaurus return on investment is 1,800 hours or one acre compared to a forestry bucket truck manual crew combination. In, in that um, operation, we put it up against a bucket truck and a manual crew, depending on what could reach the trees. We had uh, Sky Trim and Vermeer. The return on investment, there's a large uh, variance here, depending on the crews that were used and depending on which operation. But it was 126 to 283 acres or 2,500 to 5,600 hours compared to a forestry bucket truck with a Vermeer tripper combination. We talked about earlier, tipping uh, operation for the ground crew was really a limiting factor for efficiency in uh, removal as well as for trimming. So chipping is slow, and the less material that gets chipped, the faster the cleanup operation will be, pretty simple. Uh, Use trained and experienced crews for special operations, such as tree work, and for operating specialized equipment to promote safety, efficiency, and operate optimized equipment performance. Specialized equipment with only one use should be shared within the district, and perhaps by more than one district, to get the most value out of the equipment, as much of the forestry equipment is very expensive. Think about using a traveling cleanup crew to go with the roadway services team, which uses the SkyTran Bandit and forestry bucket truck, so they gain that training and experience working with each other on a daily basis. So that pretty much summarizes um, the testing. I'm going to leave it to back to Jenny to talk about the recommendations for implementation of the project.
Thanks, Cheryl. So that was a lot of information, I know. And those research results, I think, even though I've been involved in it, are fascinating to see the return on investment and how fast you can do things and the different ways of doing it. Um, so the results are fascinating, but again, they only have value if they're um, used. So considering everything that we learned during this research project, everything we discovered um, and throughout this whole um, process, in the report what we did was took all the recommendations and put them into these three categories. Recommendations related to the management, I mean the maintenance of those management zones, one through four, providing training and education programs to staff, and establishing an adaptive management program. So uh, to summarize, I mean, Cheryl just went through all that, so I'll just, again, just real briefly summarize the um, uh, zone-based management recommendations. With the highest ROI um, are these. In zone one, the best thing to do is to um, use that spray truck that um, we used. And that can be used for the goal in zone one, but that spray truck, that piece of equipment can also be used in two, three, and four. So <laughs> it therefore has the highest ROI when you think about it, and we made a recommendation that every county should have access to one of those. In zone two, you use the same equipment, but now you're using a different herbicide, and that's the plant growth regulators. And that's to decrease just the turf height. Um, and if you have to, then you aug augment with the slope mowers. But by using that approach, that piece of equipment with that chemical, that you're going to achieve the management goals of that zone, zone two. In zone three, the, um, here the roadside integrated vegetation management needs are to control noxious weeds and some woody plants, the brush that's starting to come in, small trees. So here you're not going to, you're going to use the same piece of equipment, you know, again, but you're not going to do broadcast spraying. This is targeted spray. So again, this is an efficient way of using that piece of equipment and using crews and limited resources. You know what you're going to target, and you're, you've got the right tool. You've got the people trained to do it. Um, in zone four, as Cheryl just you know re said, as I was concluding, that's primarily that tree removal and pruning. So using that bucket truck and that br brontosaurus is the most efficient way of doing that, accomplishing that work. And again, it just goes to that right tool for the right job. And that's what we found out during this um, um, process. So again, the research results can't be effectively used unless the people understand them and know how to use them and put them into practice um, throughout the year. Roadside integrative vegetation management is a multifaceted program. So the training needs to be just as diverse. So that's why we've made these rec major recommendations when it comes to training staff. We think there will even be a, a higher ROI on that training if that happens for ODOT staff. So the research recommendations remain to train them in herbicide and equipment use, uh, tree maintenance and removal operations, and using the guide. We focus on those kinds of training. We believe through this research project that ODOT and the counties will see a greater effectiveness of their programs. Doing such integrative vegetation management training will also help ODOT retain qualified, well-rounded, knowledgeable staff. So we see many benefits to this training, and therefore there were a lot of recommendations about it. This research project revealed a lot of immediate, short-term um, improvements and solutions that are going to increase the efficiency and the cost-effectiveness of ODOT and, and the IBM program. But it also revealed that there's some higher level, long-range changes that could be accomplished. And that's what's here in this list. Um, so recommendations were made that in, in the long term and eventually, hopefully, ODOT will have a roadside vegetation in inventory, know what type of re uh, vegetation is out there on the roads, what the predominant species are, because once you know that, then you know the equipment and the timing and, and the supplies that you'll need. An asset inventory, you know, where are the guardrails and where are the signs. Um, a roadside integrative management uh, plan for each district. 
Ohio is very diverse ecologically, and the plants that are in it are also diverse. So each district needs to have their own specific um, plan. Uh, GIS-based work planner software. Um, this is being used on many industries. It'll help you plan your work, map your work, track the trucks, figure out the most efficient route, et cetera, et cetera. So the technology that's out there now can be applied to integrative vegetation management. Um, cultural controls. Uh, are also part of integrated vegetation management. And cultural means um, convert, like examples like converting. So kill out a noxious weed or a plant that you don't want it's in the wrong place, put in a plant that's more appropriate there. You know, put the wildflowers in or the sunflowers, the pollinators, something that's a cultural treatment. So there's recommendations related to that solution. Um, better utilization of all the equipment and um, contractors are used a lot, and that, that's great. Um, it's a team effort out there, and it could be the best thing to uh, achieve some of the successes. But when we were reviewing what the contractors did and some of the specifications they have, we just had some improve, uh, recommendations for improvements for better using the contractors when um, ODOT uses it. So I believe after this uh, two-year, three-year project, that it was definitely a success. All those numbers that Cheryl went through, I mean, I'm just still, again, taken with the value that you could find when you use some of these integrated vegetation management techniques. Little tweaking of what ODOT's doing now can make some big, big changes. And so if all these recommendations are implemented now, midterm, long term, we believe that ODOT's going to you know, benefit from it because there's going to be safer roads, less noxious weeds, it's going to be more attractive, you're going to have better fleet management, it'll be more efficient in terms of personnel, you're going to have trained personnel, highway users are going to um, see the difference, and adjacent property owners are going to see the difference, and I think it will be very successful. So right, that concludes the presentation, the overview of the study's results. And now we do have time for questions and answers from this room and from the, those of you on the webinar. And uh, again, ODOT and Davey uh, Resource Group staff are here to answer those questions. Does anybody have a question? And yes, Tom. We we generally found that no more than five people were out there. But if you're using the bandit, um, you know, you could have if you're using the all train tree trimmer, for example, you could use that one person, bandit, second person, um, excavator, third person. You probably still need somebody maybe two people on the ground who are going to take the trees down the rest of the way because the all-terrain tree trimmer can only leave the totem poles. And then you would need somebody to treat the stump. That is definitely very important. I didn't really touch on the stump treatments, but uh, yeah, we found they were very effective and the results of that are in the report as well. Yes. You mentioned the, the comparison between the forestry truck and the sky trim, that the sky trimmer open the trees up to more decay and rot. How, what's the, the forestry, how does that work? Well, um, the sky trim is on the end of a boom. So it's just a blade that only turns like this. And in order to do this, the, actually the cab rotates this way and that way with the operator in it. Um, the, bucket truck, you know, has a guy up there in the bucket with a chainsaw, so he can maneuver it any way he wants and get as close as he wants. So because the all-terrain tree trimmer is limited by what it can reach and the angle it can turn and what might be in front of it in case, like maybe there's a tree here, but there's a branch coming through from behind. Well, if he can only trim that branch here, he's going to leave a pretty good stump because there's all this back to the other tree, right? Um, but even still, if the tree was here, he's still often leaving pretty good-sized stumps. You want to be able to take 
uh, the branch back to just outside the branch bark ridge, and that's where the tree can naturally seal off the wound and create the callus and wound wood, which is going to prevent uh, disease or decay and, and compartmentalize the wound. You don't get that when you have stub cuts. And I don't remember the exact number. It was like 90 plus percent of the all-terrain tree trimmer cuts were stub cuts. Question. I was just wondering about the uh, backpack sprayer on that. Uh, I think it's the Solos. Were we it was the DB Smith Max. Or Wind Solos. Or DB Smith. Did they work pretty well? I mean, I know they had just one uh, breakdown, but I mean, yeah, I thought they were a good uh, piece of. I mean, most people treat those as uh, throwaway equipment, so you get a couple years out of it, and you consider it a win. Uh, those those units are sold at all your local hardware stores, so it's easy to find replacement parts when when you need them instead of going to a specialized <laughs> vendor. That's the reason we we purchased them with Davey. We use them because you can go to Home Depot or Lowe's and buy a new one or buy the parts you need for it. So it's pretty comparable. Yeah, there are more expensive units out there that may be more durable. But we, you know, we were talking with our guys who use them out in the field, and they tend to like <clears> this <throat> other unit better. Um, the one problem that we did experience uh, was a broken pump. Um, if I recall, it was when we were doing a basal bark application. The backpack was left in the truck overnight in freezing weather, and then they drove out to the site in the morning, and um, just the applicator gave it a pump. Probably wasn't even needed with the basal bark application. You want low pressure anyway, but it was a little too vigorous, and it just broke the handle there, so we needed to uh, get a new one, and we were able to replace the part there. Um, I know one other time when we were doing cut stump treatments, a nozzle tip was lost in the field. So, Again, that's just something easy to replace. You just call and ask for extra nozzles. The other good thing about those is the pump is inside the tank, so if there is a blowout, it's contained within the backpack. Yes? Is there a, in the manual or guidelines, is there like a chart as to optimum time to do whatever you're looking at controlling? For, for the noxious weeds, noxious yes. Weeds, uh, yeah, in that um, roadside IVM guide, we do identify the life cycle of each of the weeds and give the primary time for an oversight application as well as the secondary application time window if you miss the, the primary one. Yes. I've been uh, with a couple of organizations for quite some time doing uh, performing some of your contracted weed spray. And uh, uh, you know, probably 35 or 40 years ago, you all uh, uh, implemented or introduced the quality assurance performance contract, where it was up to the contractor to uh, uh, to specify the the material and, and its rates of application. I've noted just here of late uh, on uh, on the broadleaf weed control uh, projects that you have specified uh, Garlon 4 rather than leaving that to the contractor? Back, can you that, speak to that one? That would be for low dot, not with Mr. Davey, but yeah, uh, yeah, no problem at all with that. Uh, and it, it just depends on which district uh, wants to let those different contracts and that. I mean, we have done a lot of performance-based contracts. Uh, to be honest, I'm not too sure which district had done that. Not, not to call anybody out, but uh, uh, yeah, I, don't, I really have no idea why they would have uh, done that. I was just curious. One of the things I was going to mention about it too, and, and uh, when we uh, work with this uh, contract, work with this project with Davey, uh, we definitely want to look at everything, and they did. Looked at everything looked at great, great progresses on that. Um, and it was a little. The one thing we did the clinic question was the use of restricted use herbicides, and one of them was Toron K, which performed very well, but we're still actually as a department, uh, and I just got confirmation about this. We're a little leery about that. So we probably will still steer clear from that unless it's, extreme, uh, unless it's a special scenario. And I'd ask that any ODOT folks, if you really are set on using Tor on case, you please contact me. I'll work on our environmental section on that one too. I just want to just kind of put that the slight disclaimer. Nothing wrong with what Davey said. Great product, but just we're a little leery because it's has some. Uh, uh, it's pretty pretty potent stuff. Uh, Tor on K. The other thing is too is that another part of the implementation I gotta go and say this too is that uh, we felt that uh, kind of exposed ourselves as, as to seeing our, our tree trimming skills and uh, our uh, 
what do your vegetation management skills may not be up to par with what we'd like to see them at. So we're actually uh, going to extend uh, or enter another contract with uh, Navy on uh, doing some tree trimming uh, and also uh, certified arborist type uh, uh, training. It's going to be coming up here soon too. All right, we don't have any questions online. Do we have any more in the room? Um, we, we just asked folks early on in phase one about that, um, and we just ended up sticking with the regular work schedule of the employees. Do you remember any more? No, uh, it's really the most important thing is the label. So if it's wind, then you want to make sure that you're making So if at nighttime there's no wind and it makes sense operationally to do that to avoid, you know, higher winds during the daytime, that can be something. As far as public perception goes, uh, the bat wing, the, the wet blade type of equipment, is that's one of the benefits we mentioned is that in areas where you need to be discreet about herbicide applications, that is a piece of equipment that can be used that doesn't draw attention from the public. So as far as public perception goes for the applications, that wasn't something that we documented throughout this, but we haven't had any complaints over it. That, we do know that, but we haven't had a chance to survey the public on how they feel about herbicide applications. So I think it would be a case-by-case -case basis depending on what the region feels. Yeah. You mentioned about the district should uh, incorporate an IBM process internally in the district on congestion. If there is a, a map that shows where all of the IBM basically starts migrating, right? So they don't stop it, they find it, they don't it. So take a more holistic approach to it statewide, so I'm thinking that if you look at that, I can say for statewide, I'll be incorporating maybe into a contract you're spraying or mm -hmm. internally. Is there a map that shows like migration of this stuff or anything? Well, there are maps out there, like EDD maps, but in our research we found they were really out of date. Um, they had counties where it had been found, but there were numerous counties that it was not marked, that we, we were finding and we were testing it in. So um, we can use that as a start, I guess. <laughs> but we didn't include that map for that reason because we didn't work in every county in the state, so we couldn't say for sure whether it was in a county unless we were able to reach out to somebody and get confirmation for, for every, you know, weed in every county. Kind of like Jenny also said in a few times, which, um, I'm working on working with uh, the Office of Environmental Services and uh, working on that roadside vegetation inventory or just like where we can't mow, where we can't mow or setbacks and things, those kind of things. And then also, like Jenny mentioned too, about like a vegetation, uh, Kind of an inventory or survey out there in the area that might be incorporated into that. I know that uh, a lot of the contractors like to do herbicide spray and love to have those kind of things. Do do noxious weed applications out there, no pockets of some of those uh, uh, noxious vegetation infestations are at, so we can better target those. So yeah, it would be great be to of, have all that GIS map base that you can yeah. well, we're um, also communicate with everybody. Right, we're also incorporating, we also have populations from ODNR of threatened and endangered species of vegetation that's out there that really the general public doesn't know about. We need to have our folks aware of it so we don't uh, wipe out those threatened uh, endangered species. Yeah. As well as the wildflower plantations that are yeah, going on. And yeah, all the different uh, pioneer plantings and uh, uh, snow, living snow fences and other things mm -hmm. we're putting out. But we're investing in our other side out with vegetation so we need to protect and better manage it. So that's one of the things we are working yeah, we like to look at it by zone because certain weeds grow in on the edge of the road, <coughs> certain grow in grass, certain form large clumps beyond where you mow typically and spray. So we like to look break it down like that. Well, we're done. Um, I have certificates for TEDs up here, and you guys are welcome to move around the cabinet. <laughs> <laughs>